Without truth, there can be no justice. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Speak out! Ask those questions! Demand that truth! Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of Truth is Justice. Going into this project, one of the goals was not to show how unhinged some of Bob's most devout followers are, but nevertheless, that's definitely been one of the things that has been achieved, as I think the last couple of weeks has pretty clearly demonstrated. First there was a suggestion many months ago that I didn't exist, and that took on a life of its own, resulting in all sorts of people being contacted to try and gain information about my background. I really was left scratching my head trying to work out what relevance my new details of my life had in providing justice for Jim. Then, last Monday morning, I woke up to the news that there is now the serious suggestion offered up by one of Bob's followers, and supported by quite a few others, that either I murdered Jim, or that I was involved in his murder in some way. Now let that sink in for a moment. These devout followers of Bob's, the people who are apparently to be trusted with tracking down investigating suspects, are actually that blasé in their approach to these matters that they think suggesting I was the murderer is a reasonable step to take. Now, good luck to the alternative suspects that Bob has raised and the misery that awaits them. If someone who doesn't even live in the country, has never visited the state of Texas and literally had never heard of the case until 9 or 10 months ago, can have the finger pointed at them, I can only imagine how it would be to be someone with some innocent connection to the Melgars. To me, that suggestion kicked back and forward by Bob's followers has proven two things. The first of those being that the person who suggested that, and the people who supported his suggestion, need to take a long break from true crime, and perhaps accept that the investigation of crimes is best left up to law enforcement. And quite seriously, this whole armchair detective thing is way beyond your skill set, and whilst you might be inspired by Bob's frequent suggestions that you don't need a degree to be an expert at something, it does take something substantially more than, I don't know, watching a TV show or two and listening to an ex-fireman to label yourself an investigator or an investigative journalist or one of the other many titles uh, these people seem to throw around so casually. And the second thing I think it proves is that for so many people, this case and others like it, other cases that Bob covers on his show, has simply become a drama, not unlike the type you see on TV drama shows. It is no longer about the reality of the crimes, or victims, or the evidence, or the justice system, or even the facts. It is about the next episode, and the next dramatic twist. It's about the next bombshell or cliffhanger at the end of an episode. The fact that Jim was brutally murdered has been so lost in the haze of drama and accusations and distractions and entertainment, and even for some, apparent enjoyment. The celebrity status of this seems to have taken priority over doing anything for the actual victim. And how incredibly sad for Jim that his brutal murder has turned into such a circus, a for-profit circus that is about as far removed from justice as you can get. Now, I didn't know Jim, but from what I can tell he seems like a decent bloke who would probably be disgusted at what this reinvestigation has turned into and the treatment of innocent people like the Kingswood family. I can't see him condoning the use of language that is now being so regularly used to describe everyone involved in the prosecution of this case. Of course, none of that really matters to the people behaving in the way they are, because this is all now just an exciting show where everyone can feel like they can add investigative journalist or criminologist or blood spatter analyst or crime scene investigator to their extensive, but I suggest largely only in their own mind, list of careers. 
I remember the words I shared from Ms. Heyman Lee's brother last week, his disgust at the way his family was being treated. It prompted me to think about the number of people that justify the review of these cases on the basis of justice for the victim. We hear it time and time again. This is for the victim. This is for the person that can't speak for themselves. But as Heyman Lee's brother said, to so many people, this is just entertainment and another form of true crime drama. The wild and, I suggest, delusional accusations that I am not only paid by the state of Texas to run this podcast, but that I actually committed the murder and I'm part of some big cover-up, are so beyond what could be considered normal that it makes me seriously question exactly what some of these people are truly capable of. Quite scary, really, if you think about the lengths they have gone to and the lack of awareness and self-restraint they seem to have. It certainly prompts the question, how responsible is Bob for the actions of his followers? And hopefully that never comes to pass, but I can tell you, there are some people who are flirting so closely with the edge of what is reasonable that it is easy to imagine a situation where they cross that line with devastating consequences. I was reminded last week of the importance of what we are doing here. I saw a photo that helped me see that the people deeply impacted by the comments and actions of Bob's followers are real people with real lives, real families and real emotions. The tactic of dehumanizing these people and making them the subject of memes and jokes just makes it easier for people to hurl insults and abuse without having any real justification for doing so. And I'm not saying that corruption should not be called out. Absolutely it should be. And where it is proven to exist, it should be dealt with severely. But to scream out corruption and direct verbal attacks towards people entirely without justification is appalling. It is bullying, plain and simple. Doing so when you have an audience that are largely disinterested in fact-checking and an audience that accept as fact the comments made is dangerous and irresponsible. If I can make one point across this episode, it is this. Notice one thing that Bob does very well. Actually, not just Bob, but many of those connected with the Free Sandy movement, including what I think we will see with Bob's interview with Mr. Seacrest. The one thing they do very well is to draw attention to everyone else but Sandra. In fact, the discussion specifically about Sandra is very limited, and she hasn't even spoken with Bob publicly in any sort of lengthy way. And okay, excuses have been provided for that, but she hasn't even written a letter that could have been read out on the show. The case has been made about everyone else. With Bob, it was about Ms. Barnett, Ms. Rossi, the detectives, the medics, the jurors, the judge, the transcriptionist, even me. The focus was put on everyone else and how everyone else was corrupt and conspiring against Sandra. I think we will see the same thing with Bob's interview with Mr. Seacrest. We'll probably hear about how everyone else failed Sandra, how badly the detectives performed at their job and how, were it not for all of these people apparently having it in for Sandra, she would not have been convicted. Will we hear about the marijuana deal that Sandra was involved in just weeks before Jim's murder or the Reddit posts about the problems within the family? No, I doubt we will hear anything about that, but we will probably hear intimate details about other people details to distract from the realities of the case against Sandra. We heard from Bob a couple of days ago how the Melgar season is going to be wrapped up in the next month or so. I wanted to talk a little bit about that because something I've heard many, many times is that Bob has a process and everyone should honour and respect that process. So let's have a look at exactly what that process is because I think some people may be confused. So Bob has spent 38 episodes, well, 75 episodes if you include the Friday follow-ups in this case. And you could probably drop a couple of those that weren't altogether relevant or specifically looking at the case, but that's still well over 70 episodes dedicated to the case. The followers of Bob's have told me repeatedly how the most important part of what Bob does is the new investigation and the considering of suspects. And that is often used as a, a way to explain why Bob doesn't look thoroughly at particular pieces of evidence or why he so easily dismisses what seems like an important area of consideration. Now Liz tweeted in response to Bob's episode 35 on the 14th of April, three weeks ago, that the episode marked the beginning of the new investigation. She used those words, I'm not paraphrasing or reading into anything. To quote her, this week's episode is a must listen. It also marks the beginning of the new investigation. So what have we had since the commencement of this apparent new investigation? And remember, this is what so many people claim is Bob's bread and butter. This is the thing that everyone waits for. The new investigation is apparently so thorough and so powerful that it is worth spending about 34 weeks building up to it. 
What we have had is the shocking treatment of the Kingswood family. We've had those convicted of the Kingswood crime, all but found guilty by Bob's followers for Jim's murder, although Bob was careful enough to publicly insist that he wasn't saying they were guilty of the murder. And the rest is behind the scenes, apparently, because that is pretty much all that has been seen publicly. I'll tell you what I've seen. I've seen a show that was started with very little independent information on the case available, yet an approach was taken to achieve the release of Sandra Melga, complete with the free Sandy hashtag. I've seen a show that set about capitalising on the anti-prosecutor and anti-police sentiment currently gripping the true crime community, and this was achieved through lies, misrepresentation and misleading statements. And it had to be based on lies, misrepresentations and misleading statements because really the prosecutor, Ms Barnett, the law enforcement officers and professionals working the case, in the bigger scheme of things, didn't step a foot wrong. They were framed as the enemy. They were the villain. Not the woman convicted of Jim's murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison by a jury. They were framed as the villains through a variety of tactics, ranging from attempts to involve their non-existent children in a broader conspiracy. Some of you may remember the farce that was the attempt to link Miss Barnett with the jury foreman to a call to the followers to bombard a professional's employer with messages stating that that professional should be released from her duties. And whilst that theme carried on for the vast majority of the season, actually barely an episode went by without a verbal attack on someone, and each and every one of those verbal attacks was baseless. So while that carried on, running alongside it was a suggested reinvestigation of the investigation. And what did that entail? Well, Really, it comprised of taking the best parts of Sandra's case for innocence and insisting they were fact. The way Sandra was tied up, for example. It was insisted that it was not possible for Sandra to self-apply the restraints. That was attacked from various angles. First, the suggestion that the arms were held in a particular way, something that contradicted evidence given on the very night Sandra was found. And then that the knot was of a particular type. And once it was determined that Sandra actually could have tied herself up in that way, it sort of dropped off. We had the claim of the stolen TV, which it turned out was a whole lot of nothing really, as the 32-inch TV was so often claimed to be in the bedroom, actually showed up in the study. So then, to deal with that, they just said that there was another TV. Another TV that no one in the family or any of the family friends can actually remember the details of, which was in conflict with their seemingly remarkable ability to remember pretty much every other minute detail of the Melgar home. Then we had the Costco blouse. So there was this scenario that a female with some blood spatter on their shirt was so concerned with blood on their shirt that they would rather dump the shirt in the jacuzzi for investigators to find and test rather than be caught in the early hours of the morning with it. Forgetting the fact that these intruders would be walking down a street with large and heavy power tools, an Xbox, a guitar, a DVD player, a TV, jewellery, watches and everything else that was added to the list of claimed stolen items from the home. So Bob went through that process which in my opinion actually resulted in harming Sandra's case for innocence more than it did supporting it. And after that process, which went on for the best part of nine months, possibly two weeks worth of episodes will be dedicated to a consideration of the alternate suspects. And for those that have doubted and criticised my claims that the show was driven largely by the need to generate profits, which it did through the dramatisation of a brutal murder, I have no idea how you can escape the fact that more time will be spent verbally attacking the crime scene investigator than will be dedicated to actually considering who those supposed intruders were that committed the murder. It was somewhat telling for me when Bob spoke about reaching a point where he would be scraping the bottom of the barrel to get content for the show. So scraping the bottom of the barrel apparently wasn't when he dedicated time to verbally attacking any number of people connected with Sandra's prosecution. Scraping the bottom of the barrel would apparently be trying to find who they claim actually committed the murder. So much so that the process brings the season to a close. And of course, we have the reward money, which is touted as being publicised through radio ads and flyer drops and ambitious claims of prominent billboards being put up. I find it quite extraordinary that whilst Bob's followers can find a conspiracy in almost every aspect of Sandra's case and believe that a connected web of corruption runs from the lowest levels of the justice system right through to the highest levels, all designed to frame Sandra for a crime she didn't commit, These same people see no problem with the sums connected with the reward money. We have a $20,000 reward, $16,000 of that which Bob has noted has been provided by Liz, and $1,000 of that which was provided by Bob. Of the almost $12,000 donated by Bob's followers, only $3,000 of that will go to the actual reward, 
and 9,000 or 75% of the donations called for will go to publicity, essentially publicity for Bob and his show. Further, in the event that the reward isn't paid, and in my view, unless they approach the matter like David protests and force a false confession from someone else, it will absolutely not be paid. And those funds represent a source of funding for future advertising. 100% of the donated monies could effectively become a part of the show's advertising. Now that has to be one of the most deceptive, but seemingly effective, marketing approaches used by a true crime podcast to date. Now, we've spent the last few weeks of this podcast looking at some broader topics related to the Melgar case and wrongful convictions generally. At the same time, there have been some quite extraordinary discussions being held on our Facebook page around various elements of the case that I think are very important. Over the next couple of weeks, we will return to focusing on some of those elements which have been discussed, because it is my belief that once you hear about some of that evidence, the idea of intruders being present in the Melgar home that evening becomes even more far-fetched. This week's episode is going to be shorter than usual, but I did want to briefly take a closer look at Sandra's police interview. And not the whole interview, just one element of it that I think is interesting. And not because it necessarily points to Sandra's guilt or innocence, but because I think it says something about the way the case was presented early on by Bob. I won't play the interviews here, they are up on our website if you want to listen to them. The interview is in two parts, separated by a space of about an hour, which is a period when Sandra met with the polygraph tester. Now, there is a very curious aspect to Bob's presentation of Sandra's police interview on just his second episode dedicated to the case. The recorded police interview commences with detectives offering Sandra two cups of water. They gave her two because they noted that the cups were small. Sandra then speaks first, pulling up her jeans slightly on her right leg and then her left leg and motioning towards her ankle. Sandra touches both ankles and says, They didn't take a picture of my ankles. My ankles had been tied also. Detectives note that they will get to that soon, and they then note why they are there to get a statement from Sandra. And that is the point where Bob begins his presentation of the interview. He commences his coverage of it about a minute in and edits out the offering of water and, importantly, cutting out Sandra's reference to her ankles. If you get a chance to watch the video of Sandra's interview again, note how at the beginning of the interview, prior to the detectives joining Sandra in the interview room, Sandra has pulled up both legs of her pants above her socks showing the bare skin above her socks. Why? Uh, I don't know. Was it to draw attention to the area around her ankles? Only Sandra knows. One of the criticisms of what we do here at Truth is Justice from some devout followers of Bob's is that we pick on the little things, highlight little errors that Bob has made and the little things they claim, those little errors, don't really matter. They don't make any difference to the overall message. I strongly disagree with that assertion. I believe that it is exactly those little errors Actually, not errors, I think it is those deliberate, misleading statements and the misrepresentation of what actually took place that makes all the difference for Bob in framing the show in a particular way. It is those misleading statements and misrepresentations that set up everything. It sets up the hatred and distrust for the prosecution and the law enforcement involved in the case. It sets up the framing of the whole season around Sandra being the victim. It sets up Bob's followers in becoming fanatically obsessed with minute details that were not accurate to begin with. So why cut out the first minute or so of Sandra's interview? Why cut out the part about Sandra referencing her ankles? I think it was important for Bob to cut out that part for a number of reasons. First, the offering of water to Sandra presents a different image of the detectives to the image Bob wants to portray to his audience. And to offer two cups of water because of the small size indicates a level of compassion, something that Bob definitely doesn't want his audience to attribute to the detectives. It might seem small, but remember... It is these small things that Bob needs to paint a particular picture. Second, it is a topic commented on almost ad nauseum that Sandra never complained about things to do with her. Bob repeats that over and over again. Liz repeats that over and over again. In fact, in specific reference to Sandra's behaviour on the evening of Jim's murder, Liz makes the following comment about Sandra's behaviour. And to quote, The injuries, her discomfort, are the absolute last things on her mind. The very first thing that Sandra says when the detectives enter the interview room is state that her ankles weren't photographed and that she was tied by her ankles. The very first thing she does is to lift up the bottom of her jeans and motion to the bare skin above her socks. She makes those comments and takes those actions before the formal interview had even commenced. And why? Why would she do that? There's been some great discussions on this on our Facebook page with some excellent analysis. 
My personal opinion is that Sandra was trying to draw attention to the fact that she had ankle bindings restraining her because those bindings had not yet received the attention that she believed they would have. You can observe how, throughout the interview, Sandra repeatedly draws attention to her wrists in a way that I think is designed to highlight to the detectives that she was unable to commit the murder because she was restrained. If you're of the view that Sandra is guilty, then the self-application of those restraints would have been in Sandra's mind, a way to almost certainly take the attention away from her as the person who committed the crime. I believe the initial reference in this interview to the ankles was along those same lines, perhaps trying to start the interview in a particular way, focusing on how she couldn't have committed the murder because she was restrained. And for Bob, that first minute or so isn't the best way to position Sandra or the detectives. So the easiest thing to do from Bob's perspective is just to cut out the first minute or so. Some might say that Bob didn't have the full clip, but that isn't correct. And we know that because the full interview, including the first minute, is put up on YouTube with a truth and justice intro about five days later. But as we know, the percentage of people that would actually go and watch that video compared to those that listen to the podcast is actually quite small. So that initial portrayal of the interview was very effective. I also wanted to briefly mention the significant criticism levelled at Detectives Carazole and Doucet over that interview. It went on for weeks and weeks, with the criticism of the detectives coming not only from those on the Facebook pages connected with Bob's show, but also directly from Bob himself. Now, I'm obviously not a detective, but I know enough about the work they do to know that it can be extremely challenging, especially homicide cases. What I thought was very interesting was the feedback given by Mr. Jim Fitzgerald on the efforts by Detectives Carazole and Doucet during his discussion with Bob. Now to quote Mr. Fitzgerald in reference to Sandra's interview, and also note how he refers to it as an interview, not the interrogation and the torture that Bob prefers to refer to it as. So to quote Mr. Fitzgerald, I conducted these types of interviews too, both as a police officer and later an FBI agent, sometimes under two hours, sometimes longer than two hours and trying to get the truth out of someone, and I think, on the whole, I'll give some praise to the detectives. They didn't browbeat her, they didn't slam their fists, there really wasn't a good cop, bad cop scenario. You could argue a little bit there at the end of some points, but I think, on the whole, you know, they did the best job they could in trying to undertake this interview and find the facts of it. Now, if you're a proponent of Sandra or the police, you may think, you know, they pushed some buttons or tried to that they shouldn't have. But legally and constitutionally, you know they are protected in doing these types of things. And what was Bob's comment to that specific point? Nothing. And why? Because it doesn't fit with the narrative that Bob has been telling everyone from day one. It goes against the narrative that the detectives were torturing Sandra, and on the whole, that they were terrible at their jobs. But as with so many elements of his coverage of the case, specifically with respect to that point made by Mr Fitzgerald, it was a matter of turn away, nothing to see here. Focus on the other things that Mr Fitzgerald said, not that part. Next week on Truth is Justice, we will take a closer look at a few things, including the amended DNA report. As I said before, that report and some other points raised on our page by some of our listeners have some very interesting implications for the intruder argument and makes the Sanders innocent claims that little bit more difficult to believe. Thank you everyone for listening and we look forward to you joining us next week on Truth is Justice as we continue to set the record straight.